We are here, you are where you are, and we are here together. God is with us and it's ready to worship online. What a blessing it is to be able to do this, how humble uh, we are here at Trinity that you're choosing to worship our great big God with us. And we're talking about some great big God questions. And so uh, here we go. As we get ready to worship, I want to encourage you, find the Church Center app, find Trinity Utica, check in with us, let us know you're here with us, certainly partner with us in our missions here at Trinity as well. And so let's get ready to worship our great big God. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He has risen, and so we gather on the Lord's day, living in this truth, the foundation 
of our faith. And so it's good to be with you this morning here at Trinity for our traditional worship. I'm Pastor Justin Krupski, in case we have never met, and Pastor Chad Wright will be with us as well. A couple announcements I want to share with you as we move forward uh, together. The first uh, announcement is this. It's in your welcome bulletin. We have a new small group, new Bible study opportunity starting up here in April. We're going to be going through a book uh, by a man named Max Licato. It's about prayer, and so we're hoping that more and more of us get involved in God's Word, but also in the fellowship with other believers, and we all learn how to pray even more. And so there's some sign-ups, and you'll see more opportunities back in the narthex at the welcome table. And so please check that opportunity out, prayerfully consider uh, becoming part of that. And we have a couple uh, children's opportunities coming up. And the first one is VBS. VBS is happening this summer. And so I think there's some people here that love Jesus. Yes, anybody here that loves children? Yes, and so opportunity to volunteer. We need a lot of volunteers to make this happen. So I believe there's a, a leadership meeting today at 12.15, uh, Stephanie Davis is the person to contact if you want to help volunteer, but also we got to keep getting the word out there uh, to the community around us that we have this opportunity, and so if you know people with little kids, uh, feel free to invite them to Stellar. And then along with VBS, uh, Trinity has hosted a summer camp here. We've run a summer camp, uh, and it's almost VBS all summer long. We've done this for almost a decade now, and so we have a video that we want to draw your attention to about the summer camp opportunity for the community around us. Lots of opportunities here at Trinity, certainly in the summer. I know it's a way off, but we got to be planning for it. I also want to remind you, we have a voters meeting uh, next Sunday, uh, so make sure that you register to vote, and the voters meeting is in regards to our sanctuary uh, renovations. And then as well as that, Pastor Christian Jones, want to let you know is he's going to be installed next weekend at our Saturday service, and so we're excited for Pastor Christian Jones' ministry as it begins here at Trinity. And so let's rise now, let's give each other the peace uh, of the Lord.
seated in the sanctuary. Our Old Testament reading is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, starting at verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading is taken from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, starting at verse 1. The Apostle Paul wrote, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom who are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. This is the word of our Lord. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel taken from St. Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 1. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good also to me, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. This is the word of the Lord. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim his salvation from day to day. Give to the Lord all glory and strength. Give him the honor due his name. Alleluia, alleluia. Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. Give to the Lord all glory and strength. Give him the honor to his name. Alleluia, alleluia. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Part of our creedal instruction today, we take from the Apostles' Creed the third article and Luther's explanation in the small catechism, as the head of the family should teach it in a simple way to his household. What is the third article of the Apostles' Creed? I I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, 
enlighten me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. You may be seated. Please bow your heads as I pray. Uh, Gracious God, we thank you for the gospel, the peace, the life, the freedom, the assurance, Lord, that you have given to us in it. Lord, in this moment, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts, may they be pleasing to you, for you are our rock, you are our redeemer, you are our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. First Peter. 3 verse 15, Peter said this to the first disciple, always be prepared in your hearts, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Always be prepared. There's a world out there that has questions. And so it's our hope as a pastoral staff, as we continue this sermon series called Great Big God Questions, that you will be prepared to share your faith, to defend your faith. And not just that, but that you and I will be strengthened in our resolve, in our faith, in our trust in God. And so today, as we continue Great Big God Questions together, the question at hand is this, is the Bible trustworthy? The Bible itself, trustworthy, but before we get into the Bible itself, we need to go at the heart of our faith. So the question is, is the gospel of Jesus 
trustworthy. The gospel of Jesus, the message, the work of Jesus, is it trustworthy? Right? The headlines of our, our faith, the good news of our faith. Paul said it, I want to read it again from 1 Corinthians, because this is what was at stake in the first century for the first disciples, right? The gospel, is it trustworthy or not? And so Paul says, now I'd remind you, brothers, of the gospel, of the gospel. The question is, well, what is the gospel? The gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, to this gospel, unless you believed it in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, here's the gospel, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. And when Paul says scriptures, he's talking about the 39 books of the Old Testament, all the prophecies that spoke about the Messiah coming to make us right with God Almighty. He died for your sins. Also that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. All the prophecies that said he wouldn't just die for your sins, but that he'd overcome death in the grave. And as he overcame death, as Easter happened, he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and to the other disciples. There's eyewitnesses of the headlines of our faith, and not just to the other disciples, but Paul says this in verse 6. He also uh, appeared to more than 500, 500 eyewitnesses at one time, most of whom are still alive to bear witness, to bear testimony that, yes, Jesus was crucified, but that he rose again from the dead, those also who have fallen asleep, right? The gospel. Think about this for a moment, and we might get deep this morning, but this is on purpose, so we need to stretch our minds as we prepare ourselves at the gospel. What is the gospel? Christ Jesus died for our sins and he rose from the dead. Is that trustworthy? Here's what I believe you and I know and what all mankind knows, in fact. We heard it right in the book of Exodus. We have a creator. This past week there was an eclipse I love to hear at Trinity, we had praise music going on, talking about our creator, God, in the parking lot as children in our school and families were gathered, looking at God's creation. Creation, we know. There is a creator. Somebody, something designed everything. There's no way, logically speaking, reasonably thinking, it takes more faith to believe that there was not a creator rather than there is a creator. Right? Creation screams it, shouts it. The fingerprint of God is there all around us. Right? That's truth. And the other truth is this that creation has in its hearts and its mind is the law of God. That God created us with a, a blueprint, if you will, of how to live, but that we don't live that way. That we're fallen. That's inside of us. That's ingrained in each of us. And we know this. We know this to be true. But the gospel is that, yes, that's true, but God made a way because your sin separated you from your creator, whom you are accountable. Eternity is in your heart, and how are you going to make it right with him? The gospel is that he made it right with you. He made it right with us through Jesus' death and resurrection. Right? That's the gospel. And and so the question is, is... Is it trustworthy? Is the gospel trustworthy? For you and I, as we're in this moment together, do we trust in the gospel? Namely, Jesus. The personhood of Jesus and the work of Jesus for us. Jesus said this in John chapter 3, 16. It's recorded for us. God so loved the whole world that he gave his only son to whoever believes in him believes in his work, believes in his personhood, should not perish but have eternal life, right? Pastor Nick preached on the inclusivity of that statement, of that truth, but also the exclusivity of that belief in the gospel. And here's why we go at that question first as we get into this message together, because if we believe in the gospel, 
that Jesus is our Savior, that we needed a Savior, then we value the Bible. Then the Bible becomes more of a trustworthy book itself. And not just the four Gospels that tell about the work of Jesus and the personhood of Jesus, but the 39 books prophesying to that work, proclaiming God's truth in the 23 other books found in the New Testament right, that confess faith in the person of Jesus and expound on the message and the freedom of the gospel in Jesus. So oftentimes, disciples of Jesus get this mixed up. Okay? We worship the book instead of the person. We trust, we believe in Jesus, therefore we value the book. And so we need to talk about the book. And as we talk about the book, we need to talk about, because this is where the world is coming at us and the world has come at the faith of, of Christianity, the belief in Jesus. We need to talk about the four written gospel accounts. We need to talk about these four written gospel accounts. And the first question at hand is this, is are the four written gospels historically reliable? So this is where the gospels are under attack the most in the modern world. Not just the modern world, but the last couple hundred years that you've seen writings, you've seen skeptics, you've seen people who think that they're scholarly and, and they go at the scriptures, specifically the four gospels, saying that they're legend. They're legend, right? They made up this story, this character of Jesus. Yes, he existed, but not his miracles, not his resurrection, right? This is legendary. And so is it, in fact, historically reliable or not these four gospels? So I want to give you three uh, thoughts, three truths uh, about this, and hopefully you're able to take notes because this is a lot this morning. I'm going to admit this. This is a lot. The first truth is this is eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses help us understand ancient writings and that they would be historically reliable. And I love the Gospels themselves because there's a lot of eyewitnesses, names mentioned when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John calling out eyewitnesses. And so eyewitnesses are important to history. And so Mark chapter 15, verse 21, as Mark's expounding on the gospel of Jesus, the work of Jesus, the person of Jesus, and the Good Friday moment as Jesus is carrying the cross, going to Calvary, says, and they compel the passerby, notice this, Simon of Cyrene. Right? In the first century, people would know who Simon of Cyrene is. Mark's readers would know who that is, an actual eyewitness who saw Jesus die on the cross because of the crime of blasphemy, actually saying, I am God. So Simon of Serene witnessed this. And not just that, he was coming in from the country. The father noticed these other eyewitnesses of Alexander and Rufus. You can go ask these men. That's what Mark would be saying. That's what history would tell us. There's eyewitnesses to carry his cross. This might seem minuscule, but this is huge. To be prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have, to be prepared to give an answer to the value that we put into the Gospels and the historical reliability. Eyewitnesses. Luke says, hey, I'm an eyewitness. I have worked so hard, Theophilus, to be able to share this with you. I've interviewed individuals who are there. I I've gone through this. And you read the Gospels, P person after person after person. In fact, what Paul said to the church in Corinth, 500 eyewitnesses, you could talk to them. Many of them are still alive today. They saw Jesus after he was dead. They saw him alive. Go talk to them. This is important for us to strengthen our faith, yes, and what we believe is true, but also to carry to the world. Second truth is this, when people look in the historical reliability of ancient documents versus legendary writings, because there are a lot of legendary writings, right, from history. But the content itself, and here's what scholars say, the content itself is too real compared to legendary writings. 
to compare to tales, compared to the fairy tales, if you will. The content is just too real, too specific. And so again, in Mark chapter 4, verse 38, you hear this about Jesus. He was in the stern of a boat, and he was asleep on a cushion. That little detail there has significance. Right? Why would you put that in a book if it was just a legend, if it was just a fairy tale? You don't, especially in historical writings. And it says, they woke him saying, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Not just that little detail, but when you read the gospels, you see very specific things. How many fish did the disciples catch after Jesus rose again from the dead when Jesus met Peter and the others on the beach? 153. That's a very little specific detail that is telling us almost 2,000 years later, we can trust this. The emotions portrayed by Jesus and the disciples themselves and those Others mentioned in the Gospels, confusion, doubt, anger, frustration. It's real content. And then you look at the numbers, the very specific numbers of, of years someone was possessed, someone was tormented. There's these very specific details that help us understand that, yes, in fact, the four Gospels are historically reliable. The third truth about the historical reliability of the four Gospels themselves is the agenda that they give. And this is probably the thing that's most under attack when people look at the four Gospels. They think there's some hidden agenda, some power play that early Christians wanted to put into play so that they could rule the world. And the very fact of me saying that out loud, and you and I know this as followers of Jesus, if we don't know this, lean into this, there's no power play that Jesus sought to give. There's no power play that his disciples sought to put into this world. Right? We hear this about Peter, right? the leader of the disciples of the early church. Mark chapter 14, verse 71, it says this about Peter, right? the leader. He began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. I do not know Jesus. Right? What does it do if, if Peter and the other disciples are trying to bring power into this world by portraying themselves as ones who would betray a hero? Not good for character development or to make a case statement of why I should lead the world. And it's contrary to the world in which they, they lived in, where Rome was all about power, showing people imperfection, and Greece also was. And even in the Jewish faith, right, it was all about power, but Jesus came with an agenda, and what was that agenda? Put other people above yourself, right? Sacrifice, submit, honor. Right? There's a clear agenda that Jesus brought, and it was not what skeptics and what quote-unquote scholars say that Christianity brought into this world. It doesn't fit. Right? The agenda was the gospel. I'm forgiving you because you're such a mess. I'm making it right. right? Where's the power in that? So the historical reliability of the four Gospels, we need to be prepared. And our faith, I pray, is strengthened. Not just historical reliability, but the other thing that is under attack when it comes to the four Gospels is scholar after scholar, college professor after college professor around the whole world continue to attack the Gospels with this question. Are the four written Gospels culturally regressive. Regressive. So stick with me here. There are many people who believe that Christianity subjugates women. Right? That devalues women. And so in the four Gospels themselves, are women devalued? 
or are they raised up with value in their worth, right? Jesus, and we could go text after text after text to see that that statement that's out there is not true. Right? Luke chapter 13, here's what we have. It says, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spear for 18 years. Notice that specific truth. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, woman, you are freed from your disability, compassion, value, worth. And I love this because Jesus didn't touch her as a sign of power or in an appropriate way of touching from a man to a woman, but he laid his hand on her and he healed her. He healed her. And I hope you know this. This is why we gather for Sabbath, for sacred assembly, because Jesus heals. Jesus was there on Sabbath, and he's here on Sabbath in the sacred assembly to bring his truth, his freeing truth to us. And immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. In the Gospels, women are clearly not property. There is clear value. There is clear worth. All right. Why do the gospel writers, right, let us know the truth of the people that were eyewitnesses of the cross? Where were the men? Where were the disciples at the cross? They were gone. Where were the women? They were there. Who was at the empty tomb first? The woman. Carrying the message of the gospel first. Right. Over and over again, you see the value, you see the worth of women. And certainly not just there, but I would argue in the rest of the 62 other books in the Bible, you see that. And I think for me as a husband, and I dig into the Gospels, and I dig into the early writings of the church that gives strength and faith in the message of Jesus, what I know as a husband my wife, Jenny, is more important than me. I'm called to actually sacrifice for her like Jesus sacrificed for us. That's what I'm called to do. But yet, that's out there. The second thing that gets brought up in academia and all around the world, and maybe you've heard this, is, is Christianity right, brought modern-day slavery as you and I know it. Is that true? Mark chapter 12, verse 31, Jesus said this, right? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus told us, who is your neighbor? Everybody. Every culture, every race. You see it through his, his teachings. You're not allowed to devalue your neighbor. This is the commandment, right? Deuteronomy 24 says this. If a man is found stealing one of his brothers, of the people of Israel, and he treats him as a slave or sells him, then the thief shall die. You shall purge the evil from your midst. That is a loaded statement, and I realize that. And what's sad to say is there are people who have used the Scriptures to do horrific things. That's true. But those people didn't read the Scriptures didn't dig deep into the Scriptures to fully understand. And when the Scriptures speak about slavery, it is a different concept than when you and I know what you and I read in the history books of modern history. That was not the four Gospels. That was not Jesus. That was not the truth of God. And so I wish people would have read the Bible <laughs> fully, and understood its context. And I still pray for that in this world, that we would dig deeper. If there's something that's confusing or misleading from the clear teachings of our faith, dig deeper. Dig deeper. Always dig deeper. So Pastor Chad and I were talking before, and I told him I could preach three hours on this. I could do a four-hour seminar. Right? And I hope what we just talked about prepares you I hope it equips you. But here's what I've learned to be true in my own life and witnessing to the world and going at 
mindful questions like this. The question really is not, is the Bible trustworthy? The question is that individuals after individuals come back to in conversations that I've had, but we need to be able to talk about the Bible. The question is, is God trustworthy? Is God trustworthy? Atheists, scientists who push evolutionary theory and try to wipe away a creator, right? those who go at the Gospels, Time and time again in the conversations I have with them, ultimately what it comes down to is, Justin, explain to me why my mom died when I was seven years old. Justin, explain to me why my dad abused me. Where was God in that? If you believe in a God, how can that happen? And so the question is, is God trustworthy? We need to be able to, to go to that, and we will go to that in this sermon series with you all. But Jesus said this for us when it comes to the problem of evil and the problem of suffering. And I hope we know this, this book addresses evil and understanding where God is. And certainly the gospel even does that as well. But Jesus said in John 16, verse 33, right, I've told you all these things. That in me you may have peace, right? In the world you will have trouble. Right? And I don't picture Jesus just saying it as I said it. Jesus was compassionately, empathetically, sympathetically in that moment. And I have no doubt in my mind, Jesus had tears in his eyes when he said that. In this world you are going to have trouble. I didn't create this, but I loved you so much. Right, free will, and I have a plan bigger than you'll ever understand. My heart is there with you. My heart breaks with you. But I'm making this right. And if you can have courage to hang on through it, you'll see that I am good. You'll see that that wasn't me. It isn't me. I am good, and I am with you through this. Right? Take heart. I have overcome the world. When we dig deep into our faith, right? The evidence is almost embarrassing of how amazing this book really is. Right? And I hope that you and I are in, empowered to know that this is reliable, this is trustworthy. But it starts right here. It always starts right here. This is a good book. This is a great book. This is God's word for us. And it strengthens our faith in truth that God is good. Yes, we have a creator. Yes, we have brought suffering into this world. But yes, yes, and yes, he has made a way for us. There is good news for us in what he did for us in Jesus. And so, hallelujah, Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Let's sing the gospel shows the Father's grace.
time we uh, take time to gather the offerings of God's people. Uh, if you're joining us online and you want to participate, you can uh, give by using the Church Center app or texting the word Trinity to 586-731-4490. You can also make prayer requests through that uh, text or through the Church Center app. In the sanctuary, if you have any prayer requests, you can write them out on the We Care cards that are in the pew in front of you and make sure those get passed along to the ushers as they collect the offering. Uh, during the offering, we'll take time also to hear the children's message from our own Stephanie Davis, our children's ministry director. collect trading cards of some sort. Maybe you have collected cards that look like mine. Maybe you once had an opportunity to trade one of your cards for something you thought was better. The problem is though, once you trade, it's final. Maybe you made a trade, but later you regretted it. Today in our Bible story, we're going to look at someone who made a trade that they later regretted. Our story comes from the book of Genesis with two brothers named Jacob and Esau. One day, Jacob was cooking some stew. Esau came in from hunting and was very hungry. Esau saw Jacob's stew and asked for some. And Jacob told Esau that he wouldn't give him the stew, but he was willing to make a trade. He said he would give Esau some stew if Esau would give him the rights of being the firstborn in the family. You see, at this time in history, the oldest son was always given certain privileges that his younger brothers wouldn't get. For example, the oldest son would get most of the family's money and stuff when the father passed away, and the oldest son would eventually be seen as the leader of the entire family. So this trade was a really big deal. Jacob was asking for a lot in exchange for a bowl of stew. But you know what? Esau accepted Jacob's offer. He was so hungry that he didn't want to wait. So Jacob gave Esau some stew, and Esau gave away his rights as the firstborn son. Esau was impatient. He wasn't willing to wait, and so he gave up his place as the future leader of the family. Esau didn't value the rights that belonged to him as the oldest son. Esau didn't stop to think about what he was really doing, and he ended up missing out on a lot of good things. So what can we learn from Esau's impatience? Think twice. Stop and ask God to help you make the wise choice so you don't end up doing something you regret. Whatever situation you find yourself in, you can always ask God to help you wait. God's Spirit can help us to have patience, even when we think we can't do it. I bet you can think of some situations in your life where you feel like you just couldn't wait another second for something to happen. What can you do when you feel like you can't wait? You can stop and think twice. You can pray and ask God to help you. Having been encouraged by his word, we respond uh, as we sing together and we pray together. Uh, the Apostle Paul taught us, this is part of our life together as the body of Christ, that we are filled with the Spirit as we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in our hearts to God. The Holy Spirit promises to come and fill us as we encourage one another in the faith, as we sing out his praises. So let's rise and we join together in one of the oldest hymns of the church, the Te Deum Laudamus, we praise you, O God.
Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, how great is the love you have lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, you have called, gathered, and enlightened your people down through the ages from every tribe and nation and language and people. And so we respond continually and joyfully praising you all our days until finally we join you in eternal glory with all the saints and, and all the angels. We pray, Lord, that you would keep us steadfast in this true faith. Help us to share this faith with others and as we have opportunity to speak the truth to others in love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O gracious Father, we give you thanks for all the many blessings you shower upon us in this life, for the gift of your word and sacraments. And today especially we re rejoice that you are adding to your, the numbers of your saints the, the names we place before you and trust in your care for Alexander, Connor, Evelyn, and Noah. Father, as you bring them into your family through the adoption by your Holy Spirit through water and word, so bless their parents that they might continually grow up in your word and understanding how much you love them and your plans for them. And we pray, Lord, that your congregation, the church here at Trinity, would continue to support the ministry of equipping and encouraging parents to be the first disciplers of these children. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Gracious Father, we thank you for the gift of life and for the blessings of family and friends. We especially thank you for those who are celebrating birthdays this week and especially named before you, Cheryl, Mark, Latour, Catherine. As they celebrate birthdays, Lord, help them to remember what you have done for them and help them to trust you for the days ahead. Even as we celebrate life, Lord, we pray for those who are struggling with issues of life, for mothers with unborn babies, that you would help them recognize that gift of life. For individuals who are facing the end of their life and making decisions about how to proceed with that, we pray for your continued guidance. Uh, Lord, we know you are the one who gives life and decides when it ends. And so we pray that you would help us to live that out in our life and our confession of faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for the gift of marriage. You have shown us in Scripture the beautiful example of Christ, the bridegroom, loving his bride, the church. Help husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church by laying down his life for, for her. Help wives respond in joyful submission, placing their will under the will of their husband just as the church does for Christ. We celebrate with those who are celebrating wedding anniversaries this week. We pray for John and Melissa Zolke as they celebrate their 25th anniversary and Alan and Phyllis Hamilton as they celebrate their 68th anniversary. Lord, continue to be the center of their marriage. Help all husbands and wives to, to trust in you and live out this beautiful gift of, of marriage in their lives, honoring you. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Gracious Father, you, came into this, you gave your Son to come into this world so that we might know you and by knowing you, have eternal life. Through revealing yourself to us and your Son, you have given us the assurance that we are your children, even as we face trials and troubles in this life. We pray, Lord, that you would be with those who are hurting, those who are facing surgeries, those who are hospitalized, that you would bring about healing. Help them to trust in you in this time of trouble, knowing that you are for them. We pray especially... Uh, those we name before you for John Banasek, Drew, Drew Fergan, Bob Keatson, John Goal, Lori Grassley, Sharon Hisner, Dale Castolt, Michelle Keel, Randy Levinsky, Mary Jo, Bob McErnerney, Diana Mercino, Vince Monaro, Shirley Mendeline, Octavia, 
Jennifer Rules, Sophie, Michelle Sitkowitz, Gigi Williams. We pray also, Lord, for those on our short-term and long-term prayer lists. On their behalf, Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray, Lord, for those facing the end of life, especially for Cindy, who now is in hospice care. Uh, we pray for the family of Nancy Langtot. As they mourn her passing, Lord, help them to move forward in their grief, also experiencing the hope of eternal life, that they will see her again. For as you brought her into the faith, you have made a promise that all who believe in you shall not die, but have eternal life. And so they will see her again on the day of the resurrection of all people. We pray, Lord, also for those facing uh, physical and, and financial struggles. Lord, we pray especially that you be with the Kaluzi family as they have experienced a house fire. As we have opportunity, Lord, help us to be there for them, to support them, uh, to, to care for them in this time. Lord, we pray for Christian Fritchie and her family as she discerns a call to serve here at Trinity as our second grade teacher. We pray, Lord, for all of our ministries here at Trinity. We thank you for the, the many blessings you, you shower upon us uh, as individuals and family and friends. Help us to continue to work together in the unity of your spirit and the bonds of peace. Uh, help us to share the gospel as you equip us to go out into our community and into our world and share Christ's story with love. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for our government, for our president, for our Congress people, for all those who serve here in our state, our governor and Congress people of our state, for all local officials. We pray also for our military and all law enforcement, Lord. Continue to be with all these servants that they might uphold peace we pray for the leaders of the world, Lord, that where there is violence and war, that you would bring peace and concord. All these things we trust in you as you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all these things and everything else that it is necessary to pray, we bring to you in the words that your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, you overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life. We humbly pray that we may live before you in righteousness and purity forever. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
the Word of God. Uh, I pray that this message today, this worship time, has increased your value uh, in God's Word, what we call the Bible, right? the beautiful book that God has put together for us to sustain us, to strengthen us, to encourage us, and certainly even to call us out when we need to be called out. And so get into the Word this week. And as we move forward together this week, I want to encourage you to do something that we call Faith 5. Take five minutes today, uh, maybe later on this week with those in your life. Talk about life. Talk about highs. Talk about lows. Talk about your relationship with God and the message that you heard today. And then pray with each other and then give each other some encouragement this week. We hope you're able to worship with us again next week. Don't forget, be an evangelist and take this link, share it on your social media thread, share an email, share it through a text message. Get out there and share Christ's story with love.